T-Biz Podcast delivers T-News that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. The T-Biz Podcast and blog connect you directly to experts in the tea lands. Listen as their voices reveal the news, innovations, cultural insights, and consumer trends that most impact the industry. Paired with Tea Journey, a digital magazine for tea enthusiasts, the Tea Biz Portal is a global resource for everyone who loves tea. Hello, everyone. Here are this week's headlines. Why is the first flush tea so tasty? It's the metabolites. Oversupply is threatening Kenya's harvest windfall. World Tea Expo, an infusion of fresh ideas, opens this weekend. Deloitte, the world's largest accounting and business services network, writes that embedding purpose as part of the entire value chain can have a lasting and powerful impact on brands. However, a Deloitte survey reveals a substantial disconnect between how brands and consumers regard sustainability claims and products. Deloitte writes that consumers are confused and frustrated by the proliferation of sustainability claims. Their survey revealed that 57% of Canadian consumers do not believe most green claims that brands make. At the same time, 71% of the business leaders making those claims say the public has a significant or moderate level of trust in their authenticity. Joining us today is Annabelle Calmer founder of Tea Rebellion, a small direct trade single farm tea venture founded in 2017. The company was certified as a B Corp in September 2022. Annabelle describes the DNA of a purpose-driven tea venture and the challenge of changing how tea is traded, marketed, and consumed. More in a minute, but first this important message. What makes a perfect cup of Ceylon tea? The perfect cup is from the tea businesses that ensure the protection of all the children living within their tea estates. We salute Keilani Valley, Telawakili, Bogawanthalawa, Harana, and Eliptia tea estates. Support Save the Children, Sri Lanka. The allure of first flush teas has inspired poets for centuries. But what of the science? Scientists are rhapsodic, too. In spring, the buds of high mountain teas burst with amino acids. Tea leaves contain significantly more carbohydrates, flavanols, and polyphenols in spring and autumn. According to a 2020 study published in Food Research International, Flavonoids and flavanols, the good-tasting, good-for-you compounds, catechins, and amino acids abundant in spring leaves, showed sharp seasonal differences. The researchers concluded that harvesting time was one of the most critical factors affecting metabolites that are most closely related to the quality of green tea. A team analyzing young translucent Anjibacha leaves plucked on March 6th found their leaf chemistry significantly differed from leaves from the same plants plucked on May 10. The analysis, which combined liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, LCMS, was found to, quote, assess tea quality objectively and reliably, end quote. Since then, the research has been used to ascertain optimal harvest dates to take advantage of tea's multiple health-promoting effects, which are primarily attributed to its secondary metabolites, including polyphenols, amino acids, caffeine, and similar compounds. Last year, Chinese researchers using the same technique found that they could distinguish all six categories of tea by calculating differences in the accumulation of signature compounds. The study involved 1,329 leaf samples collected from every major tea-producing region in China, Most samples, 1,146, 
were green teas, but categories included white, yellow, oolong, black, and dark tea. The concentration of chemicals revealed the geographical origin and harvest period. For example, in early spring, green teas from Jiangmin contain China's highest concentration of theanine and free amino acids. Researchers employing fluorescence spectroscopy found they could identify and differentiate black tea from distinct tea gardens. Their work was published in the journal Food Chemistry in January. Business Insight The studies found that fermentation significantly reduced total polyphenols, catechins, and theanine content. Tea masters intuitively know this after decades of manipulating these compounds using various processing techniques to enhance the aroma, umami, and overall taste. Now they can better source raw leaves that contain the raw compounds needed to produce a specific tea. The research also allows for verification of the varietal harvest date and locations specific to each garden. Kenyan tea exporters sold 523 million kilos in 2023, earning a record 180 billion shillings. That's about 1.23 billion U.S. dollars. However, oversupply due to favorable weather, subsidized fertilizer, and aggressive plucking threatened to undermine black tea prices. Tea exports are in decline and bulk tea prices are falling. The World Bank predicts tea prices will decline 2% in 2024. The Economist Intelligence Unit expects, quote, prices to weaken to an average of $2.75 per kilo in 2025, end quote. In Kenya, green leaf production rose by 15%, among Kenya Tea Development Agency smallholders from June 2023 through January. Unit prices are up 13% to 345 shillings per kilo, rewarding growers with a record bonus. But the windfall is more closely tied to currency fluctuations than demand. The slowing economy, sanctions, and war globally are contributing to auction warehouses that are bulging with staling tea. According to the East Africa Tea Traders Association, 40.7% of the tea on offer remain unsold in 2023. Traders normally buy 75% of Kenya's annual harvest at auction, but demand is unusually low, forcing the country to consider abandoning a $2.43 per kilo minimum price established in 2021. Kenya stands out as the only country among the top five producers worldwide to see gains in volume and value. China reported a second year of declining export sales to $1.74 billion. In Sri Lanka, export value increased due to high unit prices, but volume continued to decline. India saw declines in volume and value. Turkey, the world's fifth largest tea-producing country, reported tea production declined to 275,000 metric tons. Tea exports were up, but amounted to only $25 million in 22-23. Unlike China and India, Kenya's domestic tea market is relatively small, making Kenya the world's top black tea exporter, even though India produces much more significant quantities. East African tea-producing countries export the, more than 90% of the teas grown there. Kenya exports 95% of its tea, of which only 10% is blended and packed. The big surge in value did not represent a significant increase in unit prices. Auction prices fell in 2023 compared to 2022. Earnings, however, surged by almost a third on an increase in volume of 72.5 million kilos, up from the 450 million kilos sold in 2022. The full-year price average was 10% lower in 2023 than the previous year, quote, largely because we believe that market surpluses have been large in recent years and that stock levels are therefore high, writes EIU. Business Insight Ten years ago, Kenya experienced a similar bubble 
which soon burst. Acreage under T grew by 45% and production jumped by 26% between 2003 and 2012. By 2014, the Mombasa auction was selling 400,000 metric tons a year with little left unsold. The global tea surplus reached 130,000 metric tons the following year as Kenyan production reached new highs. Shortly after, green leaf prices plummeted to 35 cents per kilo, down from 55 cents per kilo in 2012. Tea profits at plantations across East Africa fell by 30% as the pricing bubble burst. The World Tea Expo returns to Las Vegas this weekend through March 20th. The annual event draws worldwide attention to a North American market that fosters innovation and rewards quality conscious producers who export specialty grade teas. The event is co located with the Bar and Restaurant Expo. It all begins Sunday with a meet and greet at the Las Vegas Convention Center. The sessions on Monday include the Tea Business Incubator, which is a must for retailers. This year's program is immersive with a new tea primer certification and hands on demonstrations essential to understanding tea's organoleptic qualities. Kevin Gascon's Rare Tea Tasting is a fantastic opportunity to experience the key in tea. Tea educator Sharon Johnson is hosting a reunion of Tea Academy graduates at the NXT stage on Tuesday afternoon. Tea Biz will be on the floor for live podcast interviews with attendees and exhibitors at the International Pavilions. Exhibitors include several Chinese, Sri Lankan, Korean, Japanese, and African tea suppliers. I'll also be hanging out at the tea bar to taste winning teas from the Beverage Challenge and with keynote speaker and good friend Jeff Fuchs on Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. Look for me at the Azillo Lounge at the Sahara on Tuesday night from 6.30 to 8 p.m. for the Tea Industry Happy Hour. Say my name when passing on the South Hall floor and you'll receive a free full-year subscription to Tea Journey magazine. Business Insight. I've attended this show for 20 years as a journalist, speaker, panelist, presenter, exhibitor, and attendee. Every year I learn something new and treasure the opportunity to mingle with a vibrant community of tea professionals. Next, Arvinda Anantharaman in Bengaluru reports on this week's India Tea News. India Tea News for the week ending 15th March 2024. Both the Indian Tea Association and the Goodrick Group have announced an appointments. Uh, the Goodrick Group has appointed Arun Narayan Singh as the Managing Director and CEO effective March 6, 2024. And this appointment follows the resignation of Atul Astana last month. Mr. Singh has held this position early and was most recently found a trustee of Tea Vision, an industry think tank building a common platform for multiple stakeholders in the tea industry and to be the industry's voice. The National Committee of the Indian Tea Association met on March 12th and announced the appointment of Hemant Bangu of Sri Vasuprada Plantations as chairman, Sunil Singh Sikand, CEO of Rasul Tea as vice chairman, and Atul Rastogi, director of Lakshmi Tea as additional vice chairman of the association. Founded in 1881, the the Indian Tea Association, headquartered in Kolkata, is India's oldest organization of tea producers. We also have news from the South. In the Nilgiris, Incosur Tea Cooperative is set to receive 7.4 crore rupees, that's approximately 900,000 US dollars, to convert its Katabetu Tea Factory into a tea tourism hub under the Tamil Nadu Innova- Innovation Initiatives Plan. The funds will be used to create a living tea museum that would house various tea plants and offer visitors an opportunity to see how tea is made and also taste different teas. Both tea and tourism are essential to the economy of the Nilgiris and this move is seen as a boost to that. Incosur is the largest tea cooperative in the country with 30,000 small farmer members and 16 factories in the Nilgiris. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Nish. I grew up in an organic tea farm and founded Nepal Tea Collective in 2016. Tea is not just a beverage for me. 
but a catalyst for social change, sustainably empowering hardworking artisans like my parents for the past 30 years. I'm on a mission to make the whole world aware of the goodness of Nepali teas and the good that comes from supporting growers in this remarkable land. If you haven't tasted Nepali teas yet, you're missing out. Our award-winning teas are making headlines. Find out why. Visit Nepal Tea Collective's website to get a free sample of this extraordinary taste of the Himalayas. That's nepalteacollective.com. Or just send me an email at nish, N-I-S-H, at nepalteacollective.com. Cheers. Deloitte, the world's largest accounting and business services network, writes that embedding purpose as part of the entire value chain can have a lasting and powerful impact on brands. However, a Deloitte survey reveals a substantial disconnect between how brands and consumers regard sustainability claims and products. Deloitte writes that consumers are confused and frustrated by the proliferation of sustainability claims. Their survey revealed that 57% of Canadian consumers do not believe most green claims that brands make. At the same time, 71% of the business leaders making those claims say the public has a significant or moderate level of trust in their authenticity. Joining us today is Annabelle Calmer, founder of Tea Rebellion, a small direct trade single farm tea venture founded in 2017. The company was certified as a B Corp in September 2022. Annabelle describes the DNA of a purpose-driven tea venture and the challenge of changing how tea is traded, marketed, and consumed. The B in B Corp signals benefit for all. In T, that means an inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economic system for everyone and the planet. There are fewer than 9,000 B Corps globally. Annabelle Calmer says, quote, incorporating the B Corp stakeholder consideration into our Articles of Corporation for the UK and Canada ensures that our environmental, social, and governance commitments are firmly embedded in the corporate structure. The goal is to be a tea brand for sustainable, transparent, award-winning tea. Tea Rebellion co-brands with farms and does not blend or flavor tea. Quote, we remain firmly wedded to our original Tea Rebellion DNA, says Annabelle, who has a master's in economics specializing in micro and rural finance. She previously worked for the World Bank and the OECD. She returned to academia to study agriculture, focusing on environment and gender. Her field work included studying female banana growers in El Salvador and coffee farmers in the Dominican Republic. To drive impact, I choose to work with tea farmers with a clear goal of sustainability and impact in their community, she said several of which are female-run or committed to the empowerment and well-being of women. Annabelle, it's a pleasure to have you join us on the T-Biz podcast this week. Tea Rebellion is a fine example of a successful, purpose-driven tea company. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and have this chat with you, Dan. The Deloitte survey I described in the introduction reveals that companies that, quote, walk the walk and, quote, gain an advantage by closing the perception gap and validating claims. Those who, quote, talk the talk often do not practice what they preach. There are 334 million corporations globally, but only 5,500 B Corps were registered two years ago when T Rebellion was first certified. As of February, there were 8,254 active B Corps in 162 industries, but that's still only about two-tenths of a percent of the globe's corporations. Let's start there. What were you thinking when you set out to qualify a B Corp? And has that worked out? 
So the B Corp certification happened uh, in the summer of 2022. By then, we had already been operating for several years and we sustainability impact through tea had always been at the core. Um, you know, we, I, I launched the company in order to affect change in trading patterns in tea and get more value um, staying with the, with the tea farms and the tea cooperatives. The reason that I chose to do the B Corp certification is because I liked how it was certifying the company versus the product. So I like that it's an ESG holistic certification, environmental social governance at its core, it has an impact assessment um, of many, many questions. I forgot the number of questions. I think like 86 or something like that. Oh. Even if you decide not to get certified, going through that questionnaire is super, super valuable because you learn so much. You learn so much about the areas of the business where you could become more sustainable that you haven't even thought about. You know, like it's it is really a a very thorough, holistic assessment. And I really appreciated that. So I'm a sustainability strategist. That's what I did for 15 years of my life. It confirmed a lot of things we're doing the right things. And then it taught me some things that I wasn't yet doing that I could be doing, right? And that was great. I decided to pursue further and actually do the certification because um, some of the wholesale partners that we are approaching, educational institutions, um, offices, have a screening mechanism that has uh, basically questions what kind of certifications you have and right. that is and that's an entry criteria are you a b corp or not not all of them have that but the kind that we want to be trading with has and so i think it's a certification that is less uh, targeted at consumers who so many of them don't fully understand it yet because it's a bit more complicated and the consumer type certifications are more fair trade and organic. But I think we should talk about certifications in general because it is a really interesting topic. The B Corp is something that companies, if you want to trade with companies, B2B appreciate and understand. The Chinese blended tea to enhance its complexity wasn't until the end of Zhu's dynasty in 256 BCE that people began boiling tea without other ingredients. The Japanese blend tea for many farms, balancing desirable features to maintain consistency. In the West, tea blending dates to the 17th century, when importers in the Netherlands were confronted with travel-worn arrivals displaying significant variations in aroma, color, and taste. Purists embraced seasonal variations of single origin. That's how you see it, right? We don't blend the flavor, the product, because we see it as an end product. Basically, we trade in finished products, it's just like a wine merchant would. If you want to make sure we trade with the same tea partners year in, year out for long-term benefit, right? So in a way, um, we'll see. I've noticed that actually from some of my farms, that even though I'm sourcing the same, the tea that's named the same, have it at the same time, there's so much variability, but that's actually what makes it quite exciting because you can then say, well, from that year, this is similar to that year. It's different to last year's, you know, like that. And I think consumers like that too. You know, in many ways, that's educating tea consumers towards appreciating that variability and consumers particularly. So let's talk about sourcing. An artisanal tea representative of a region must well, still meet specific tea rebellion standards, right? Yes, that's correct. It's important for us that we, that the farms have identified um, themselves as sustainable, are transparent, and that they're really interested in that long-term partnership with us. Do I require them to be organic certified or rainforest or wood certified? No. I do require them to have a sustainable, ideally completely agrochemicals free product though. So, I mean, I think this is, um, this is an interesting question. And I think I, I quite grappled with this being, you know, an agricultural person. My background's in agriculture. That's what I trained with. Um, when I launched this company, I thought, uh, what level of certification do I want? And do I make organic certification, for example, an entry criteria? But that what it means is that some farmers you can never trade with. Some cooperatives you can't create with. And if they have excellent tea and they're an amazing cooperative that I would want to be trading with just because they don't bother with the certification, that would be a real shame. So basically, I have a bit of a mix. I have half of my farms are organic certified. Some of them are additionally fair trade and Rainforest Alliance certified. And there's one farm, for example, who doesn't do any of that, but has a, have a very pure product from Taiwan, for example. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a varied answer, not a hard answer. I need to know the farm. 
Tea Rebellion describes a purpose-driven mission. Will you articulate your vision? I think the purpose, the mission, and the vision is to to create a fair and untainted tea trade, you know, like to raise the bar for tea, to ha- create that movement for change. And we want to do that through changing the way tea is traded, marketed, or consumed, and to provide tea lovers, ultimately the purpose to provide tea lovers who care about fair trade, etc., with award-winning, really good tea. And that is a little bit outside of the certification conundrum, as it were. And the certification only comes in because it's a requirement for doing business and it makes the data gathering easier. So, for example, if I'm trading, trading with Satemwa, um, which are a great partner in Malawi, as you, you know them well, they have various levels of certification, rainforest, um, the fair trades a while ago, and now they're looking at organic. And the fact that they have that, for example, was easier than in the B Corp certification process. I could provide those certificates and therefore that process was shortened. Yeah. The uh, selection of Satemba as a farm was less linked to them having all these certification, but the fact that they have such a strong purpose locally and commitment to sustainability and the trust I have in the trading partners that I've met. So in a way, this isn't probably overlapping, but it isn't one to one. You know, it's, it's, it's additional things that I have to do as a business to trade effectively, not necessarily my core purpose, um, which is much more about affecting change and transformation in the tea industry. Why do you characterize your brand as rebellious? Quite often I get that question at uh, tea events, you know, like the one right. we just recently met. That's very clever from a branding perspective, but what's behind it? What's revolutionary? Well, actually, yeah, right. What's revolutionary? What's your rebellion? And my rebellion really is that the farmer is not seen in tea trade. Because of the blending and the flavoring, we've taken the identity of the maker out of the system as it were. And that kind of connects with, um, you know, I used to be someone who uh, did some, a lot of research. I um, looked at banana trade in St. Lucia at some point when I was 20. And there were such rich stories of these banana uh, farmers. Um, but by the time the product had reached the shelf in the UK, no one knew these stories. That was still the case when I launched Tea Rebellion. And maybe it's uh, we are evolving towards more of that with more of single origin, single farm happening. But really, most of the tea trade, 95% of it is still like that. Their tea goes into a blending, a flavoring product, and their tea lover still doesn't know where the product comes from because usually it's a blend and a blend doesn't have an origin as such and not a maker, right? So I wanted to uh, rebel against the status quo in tea the lack of transparency in tea and uh, re- give representation to the tea farmer. And the reason it's called Tea Rebellion is because of the incident in Boston where tea was thrown in the harbor in 1773, which was also a rebellion against lack of representation. So that's a little bit of a historic artifact, as it were. So we are calling for rebellion in today's world of tea in, by getting the tea farmer representation in the tea trade and the marketing. And so we co brand on all our retail pouches with the farm. So it has the farmer name, the farm, the farm name and the farmer's identity on it. And that is very, very different. And it is a risk operationally because of course we're giving away our, our sources, but it's something we strongly believe in. In order to affect change, we need to credit the maker of the product, um, which is what, you know, the wine industry has done for a long, long time. Intrigued by what you heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of T-Biz journalists and tea experts? Remember to visit the T-Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week. Produced by Adavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world. 
BetMGM has an unreal deal for sports fans in Iowa. Turn $5 into $150 instantly when you place your first wager at BetMGM. Simply download the BetMGM app and sign up using code Hawkeye150. Then, place a $5 wager on any sport. You'll receive $150 in bonus bets, regardless of your wager's outcome. And if you think the fun stops there, the king of sportsbooks has plenty of surprises in store. Check out daily promotions, same game parlays, live bets, and so much more. No matter your team or your sport, BetMGM is for you. Download the app in Iowa today and get $150 in bonus bets instantly from your first wager only at BetMGM. BetMGM and GameSense remind you to play responsibly. See BetMGM.com for terms. 21 plus only. Iowa only. New customer offer. Subject to eligibility requirements. Rewards are non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in seven days. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF.